You may think you're hearing things, and you're going to hear today the time in the Gospels when Jesus refers back to the passage that Neil just read, the prophecy of Isaiah. This comes from the fourth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, beginning at verse 12. Now when Jesus had heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was sometime in the 1990s that I went to a United Methodist Conference. I think it was the Youth Leaders Forum. It was held in Phoenix, Arizona. I would not been to Phoenix before, so I was interested in seeing the sites. And it was very hot there. And I was registering, and I had left here in a snowstorm. So I had to go a day late, and I got there, and I was registering in line, and someone tapped me on the shoulder behind. It was one of my best friends from seminary. She lives in Michigan. And we had just talked a few days before going to the conference, and neither one of us said, oh, by the way, I'm going to Phoenix for this convention. Are you? This was back before the time when flights changing and security was so hard to do. So we decided that since we were both there, we were going to take an extra couple days to spend together and tour around. So what we did, we rented a car, and we drove from Phoenix to the rim of the Grand Canyon. If you've ever done that, it's a long ride. And we only had part of a day, and it was in winter time here and there, so the days were a little bit shorter. We got there just 15 minutes before the sun went down. I asked the man at the gate when we paid him our money to go into the National Park area, I said, could you please leave the lights on just about 20 minutes extra today? He said to me, lady, if I had that light switch, I would be working here. And we went, and we stood there for just a few brief moments to watch the sunset over the Grand Canyon. I was kind of disappointed that that's all I got to see of it. And my father, to the day that he left us, said to me, you really haven't seen the Grand Canyon. I said, as opposed to seeing it in pictures, I have seen it. But no, I didn't get to see much of it, just one vantage point. But I didn't know what miracle was going to happen on the way back to Phoenix that night. I happened to look out the window at the, just the blackness all around, and then I looked up. And we stopped the car, and we sat for probably 45 minutes staring at the sky, because I had never seen so many stars before. We could see the Milky Way. We could just make out uh, what we call falling stars, which are really meteors coming through the atmosphere, burning up. Most of them don't even reach the ground as little meteorites. We tend to romanticize the light. We call them falling stars. We talk about the sunrise. And if you've been to Ocean City, you know you love to get up early. Most of you do anyway, and watch the sun come up over the Atlantic Ocean. We even talk about things like moonlight, especially in love songs. But if you think about it, the sun does not come up. The sun does not set. And the moon does not give light. It's a reflection of the sun's light that we can see better depending on where we're standing. Just like looking up at those stars. It's not like the stars aren't here above our heads in Cockeysville, Maryland. It's just that what we call light pollution keeps us from seeing them. It's about what we see as opposed to what we don't see. I said this season after Epiphany, which is really ordinary time in the life of the church, we don't have a season called Epiphany. But Epiphany is that day that we set apart to remember the arrival of the Magi who had followed the star to see the light of the world, Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem. By the time they arrived, probably a toddler walking around and not quite knowing what was happening when these visitors showed up. And the great image of Epiphany is the star, the light that has come into the world, the light that leads people to Christ. And so I decided that this time, before the season of Lent begins, we're going to focus on those passages dealing with light and with darkness. We read today what we have read several times already during the Advent season, and even at Christmas, leading up to Christmas Eve. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. We read that from the prophet Isaiah. Now, you know the rest of the chapter, which is why I 
specifically cut it off where I did. Now it goes into, we're going to rejoice as people rejoice with the spoils of war, as in tramping the bloody garments of war, or the Battle of Midian. Midian is one of those biblical Old Testament Hebrew Bible references that's easy to remember because Midian rhymes with Gideon. Gideon, one of these little people, little from a little tribe, and yet, with very few soldiers, he conquered a great army because God was on his side, because he was on God's side. And so we read from there, and we go on, if you will remember the rest of the passage, for unto us the son is born, unto us a child is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders, he shall be called what? Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, of his reign there will be no end. Cut that a little short, because I don't want us focusing on the baby Jesus, because the baby Jesus is the same Christ who has been with God since the beginning of time. We read that last week when we read both John's prologue to his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, which harkens back to the beginning of Genesis. In the beginning, there was God. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and it was good. God speaks, and it happens. God speaks, and the Word God speaks is Jesus Christ. So today we're looking at Zebulun and Naphtali, those are sort of obscure references, aren't they? And Matthew, as I've said before, is the gospel writer who is most intent on quoting the prophets and the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of those hopes. And Jesus is here now and quoting that passage himself because this is what is being fulfilled in his coming. Now, we need to look at what happens in this story, too, because I left out part of the lectionary text, not from this year, but from another year, for this Sunday, the third Sunday after the Epiphany. But this comes after something important and before something important. Jesus is in this passage between the time, and Matthew, one of the Gospel writers, who talks about his birth. But we move from that into Jesus being baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River. Jesus is baptized, and then he is in the wilderness being tempted. And then he comes out of the wilderness. He finds out that his cousin John has been arrested. And then he does something that I didn't want you to focus on today because the song would be going through your head. He calls the fishermen. And you'd be thinking, I would make you fishers of men if you follow me. But I want us to look at Zebulun and Naphtali. What, why those obscure little passages, those little places in Galilee of the Gentiles? It's because this was an area in the time of old, in the time of Isaiah, writing about the Assyrian exile, the time when the Jews were marched from their land into captivity. And especially vulnerable were these two little tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, the area that was so often oppressed, the people were living in poverty and despair. They were living in hopelessness because the promised land had been snatched from them, or they had been snatched from the land more accurately. And again, when Jesus is born, he is not born into a time of, of Jewish independence and self-determination. He is born into the time of Roman occupation. And yet he proclaims what has always been true, that the people who sat in darkness, as he says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, light has dawned. And here we are today in our world, which may seem fairly dark. But like I said about the lights in the sky at night and the way we romanticize them, there is no, no such thing as the sun coming up because the sun is always there. Just sometimes the earth is not in the position to see it. Sometimes we're not in a position to see that the sun has come up, that the sun is there. The stars are there whether we can see them or not. And there's no such thing as a falling star. Stars don't fall from the sky. But little bits of dust and ice and things that enter our atmosphere will burn up and give us the impression that something is falling from the sky. But the stars are so far beyond our world that we cannot even begin to imagine how big they are and how many there are. I hope you get a chance sometime to be in a place that's truly dark so you can see the sky at night and to see the majesty that is there that sometimes we don't see during the day. And when the sun is up in our part of the world, it's setting somewhere else because it doesn't really set or rise. It's depending on where we are and our rotation of the earth. Not a very romantic thought, that. 
but sometimes it depends on where we're looking because we can see the stars at night, but not during the day, but they are still there. Just as sometimes when we feel darkness in our lives, we feel that God is not with us. God is always there. It just depends on where we're looking at the moment. We have to learn to look for Christ in the world and in each other. We have to learn to look beyond the darkness, to remind ourselves in passages like these that the darkness cannot overcome the light because the light of the world is God's love for us in Jesus Christ, God's redemption of humankind in Jesus Christ, God's power revealed to us in Jesus Christ. I listen to a podcast every week before I preach, and one of the things they were saying was the kingdom of God is a hard concept for people to understand because when we think kingdom, we think place. So perhaps a better way to look at it is the reign of Christ, the time, the reality of Christ, who is the light of the world, being sovereign over all things that God has made, all things that were made not without Christ's presence, as John reminded us last week and as we read. And we have to look at what happens with the light in this passage from Matthew's gospel, because Jesus has been tempted, and we ourselves will be tempted. Jesus was baptized. He submitted himself for baptism, although he knew no sin, so that we might follow his example. And even though John has been arrested, which is a time of great darkness in the life of the people, who are beginning to grasp onto the hope that was theirs in God, that the promises of the Messiah were coming true for them. Because what does John say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world when he sees his cousin coming to be baptized. He says to him, I'm not worthy, Lord. And Jesus says that he will be baptized by John anyway. And then what happens? In this time of despair for Jesus on a personal level, he turns and he calls disciples who pick up their nets and they follow him. They leave all that is behind, all that they have known, their livelihoods, their families, their security, and they follow him, not counting the cost. We romanticize light, but we also take it for granted, don't we? How many of you have just gone to get out of bed and flipped a switch and your house is filled with light? Or on the times when the electricity goes out, you really know where your furniture is until the lights are out, don't you? And then suddenly you stub your toe on something very familiar that you knew was there. I remember once I took a group of teenagers in a youth group on a mystery overnight. They didn't know where they were going, and I called one of the local caverns, Crystal Grottoes, out in the western part of Maryland, and I asked them if we could come in at night if they would open up for us, and they said, sure. And we took the kids in there, and we went underground, and they turned the lights out, and everyone sort of screamed, and suddenly I felt about 20 little sweaty teenage hands grabbing onto me to hold on because it was so disorienting. Because even in our homes, it's hard to get everything so pitch black that you can't see a thing. They said, how creepy it is to be in here at night. I said, it's just as creepy at 12 in the afternoon with the sun overhead because when you're this far underground, you can't see anything. We need to remember that the light is there, even though we take it for granted too often. The light is always with us in Jesus Christ, and he will bring us hope and peace. He will bring us into a new reality if we trust in his word and we follow his will and we learn from him. It's not always going to be easy, is it? But it will be possible because with God all things are possible. That was the message the angel delivered to his mother, the message that she treasured in her heart, that with God all things are possible. This weekend is a hard one because we're facing the inauguration of a new president. President-elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be inaugurated this week. It's also the weekend that we celebrate the birthday of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was assassinated in 1968 when I was 10 years old. I remember that day very clearly because I do believe in those days that the preacher's heart of Dr. Martin Luther King was speaking to the preacher yet to be's heart of me. And I remember hearing him preach, and I remember listening to his words and feeling the power of them. And in a sermon that he preached the year I, before I was born, it was collected into a book 
that was published in 1963, a few years later. But this is one of the things he was talking about when he was preaching a sermon on loving your enemies. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. We're at a turning point in our nation where we will continue to argue and debate and disagree and divide ourselves. And that is when the darkness will reign. Or we can turn to God and Jesus Christ. We can understand that his light has come into a very darkened world. We can remind ourselves of the promise that is ours in him and live as children who are born of light and day. Think about those people who live in Alaska in places where it's dark most of the day and sometimes 24 hours, those people who live in the far northern regions of our planet. There's even something called the non-24-hour sleep-wake disorder, which says if we spend all our time in darkness, it's going to throw off our ability to function in the world. People who live without light sometimes are depressed. Little children who need a nightlight are sometimes scared of the dark because they don't know what is there. This is when we're called to reflect the light of Christ for one another in the world and to stand against the darkness because darkness cannot overcome darkness. Only light can overcome darkness. And hate cannot overcome hate. Only love can do that. So this week, as we fear the worst for our nation, as threats of violence have erupted in all the states, as governors call out their National Guard troops, as members of our own House of Representatives in the U.S. Senate are afraid to go into the building, as others debate whether they should be allowed to carry weapons into the building, we have divided opinions on how to move forward as a nation, but we cannot be divided in our decision to love one another, regardless of what we might think should happen, what we believe should happen in terms of politics or policies. We must choose love. We must choose to remember that even though we can't see the stars, that they're still above us. And even those times when we don't feel God's presence, we have to remember that light has dawned. Just as it dawned on little Gideon and his small band of faithful soldiers, just as it dawned for the little insignificant areas called Zebulun and Naphtali, Galilee, land of the Gentiles. The light has shined into the world upon each of us. But we need to look for it. We need to live in it. And we need to share it with others. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.